Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of uh, the GEAR team uh, and uh, covering topics related to engineering seismology and geotechnical engineering. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on the uh, GEAR organization, uh, its objectives, and the team. Then I'll move on to seismotectonic setting uh, that will allow us to understand the context of this earthquake. Uh, then we'll talk about the earthquake event itself, the ground shaking. Uh, and then move on to specific topics, starting with the Kathmandu area and Kathmandu Valley, looking at the uh, ground response in the basin there, uh, followed by discussion on liquefaction and uh, soil cyclic failures slope stability and landsliding, which was the major cause of damage uh, in this earthquake. Then we'll talk about hydropower plants and projects, and we'll have some concluding remarks. Uh, geotechnical engineering is an experience-driven field, and response of natural material, soils, and rocks cannot be easily replicated in the lab uh, or even in centrifuges. And so therefore, Field observations are key for our ability to understand how the ground will perform during a particular event. So after an earthquake event, it's important that we deploy quickly within a relatively short period of time to collect perishable data. And that because some of that information no longer exists if we wait for too long. However, we don't want to deploy too early that we would end up interfering with uh, rescue operations. As part of our objectives is to also look at uh, the use and implementation of new technologies for both field reconnaissance as well as later on in design. And uh, one of the things uh, I would like to share with you this time is for the first time we were able to deploy a drone uh, to allow us to capture uh, records of damage in areas there whereby if we deploy individuals it may be a little bit risky. So that is some of the types of new technologies we're able to deploy and experiment with. Uh, of course, our objective is to document the ge geotechnical effects of extreme events and with the objective of advancing the profession's understanding, but also enhancing the reliability and safety of our infrastructure. And of course, when we go on these missions, uh, these serve as important training grounds for new generation of engineers. The GEAR Nepal team uh, was a team that consisted of members from the US, Europe, and Nepal. And it encompassed a number of organizations, educational institutions, government agencies, utilities, and the private se sector. Funding, the, a significant part of funding for the activities came from NSF, in addition to numerous contributions from a, a large number of organizations. When we have a large event, we usually try to deploy in, in waves. The first team, Team A, um, deployed uh, within a, a few weeks of the event, and its objectives were to conduct initial reconnaissance and to look at and try to find surface rupture, which by the way, for this event, none was found, uh, looked at liquefaction and looked at landslides. And uh, what you're looking at here is uh, the our GPS tracks of the areas that the team went to. And these are the epicenters of the major event, two major events which I'm going to talk about today. After Team A came back, within about a week or so, Team B deployed. And we looked at a number of uh, observations. One was liquefaction, whereby we conducted detailed s studies based on information gleaned from the first team. Uh, team B did an extensive amount of reconnaissance on dams and hydropower projects, something that is unique to, the, to this particular earthquake. We also participated in helicopter reconnaissance. Uh, we joined the USGS team to look at uh, landsliding across the country, and which allowed us also to access areas that we simply cannot get to. And also, the team looked at ground motions. Uh, I show you here two GPS set of, set of GPS tracks. First is the land routes, and also the helicopter routes that we went on. An important aspect of our work in the GEAR team is to produce a report within a short period of time to disseminate 
important informations and observations from this event. We were able to issue our report within about three months of the event, and we're currently working on an update. Um, this is, there's always an update of these uh, type of reports, but hopefully we will have one more update. Uh, the report, in addition to documenting observations, it also serves as a springboard for future detailed investigations. Uh, we were fortunate that we were able to include GPS station data in this report, and the report is available online at the Gear Association uh, website. So feel free to download it and take a look at this report. So what are the main topics of our report? We start by talk talking about the tectonic, geologic, and geomorpho geomorphic, <laughs> geomorphic setting. Uh, then we talk about seismological information and recorded ground motions. We look at ground response, slope stability and landslides, liquefaction and cyclic soil failures, and then performance of dams and hydropower facilities, performance of roadways, bridges, and retaining structures, and performance of building structures. Uh, the items that are in green are what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, there's, of course, a wealth of information in the report that we have produced. So let us start with the seismotectonic setting of this particular earthquake. This is a, a regional map. This is India, uh, Tibet, and this is where Nepal is. And in, from a tectonic point of view, we have the Indian plate colliding into a relatively stable Eura Eurasian plate. And you have that Himalayan arc developed as a result of this collision between these two major plates. The Indian plate is moving at about 40 to 50 millimeters per year uh, in a northward direction. And if we look at the cross-section uh, through Nepal, uh, we will find that there are three major fault systems, the main central thrust fault, the main boundary thrust fault, and the main frontal thrust fault. And we can see here this is the main Himalayan thrust where what we show is the area that slipped during the 25 April 2015 event, the first event, and then a later event, a smaller event in, uh, on the 12th of May. Um, we see a lot of earthquakes along uh, this fault system. There's been many historical earthquakes, more recent earthquakes, uh, all along this um, collision zone. And this earthquake and the earthquake sequence that we are talking about today is simply one of these events and we expect more to happen in the future. So let's talk about the earthquake sequence. Uh, April 25th, 2015 resulted in a moment magnitude event of 7.8, um, the largest of a sequence of events that happened around that period of time. Hundreds of aftershocks were recorded. There were five, approximately five aftershocks with a moment magnitude greater than 6.0, and the largest of which happened on May 12th, 2015, with a magnitude of 7.3. Team A was deployed during that event, and we were grateful that uh, everybody was safe, shook up, but safe after that event. Um, an important element of this uh, event is that there was no evidence of surface rupture. And uh, a more detailed evaluation has shown us that, in fact, uh, this level of magnitudes um, are not always expected to result in any surface manifestation. Uh, larger magnitude earthquakes do result in, the, in, in a surface rupture. What was noted, though, is there were elevated groundwater levels and significantly increased spring and stream flow volumes uh, in the watersheds along the MBT for more than several weeks after the 25 April event. Uh, here you can see the epicentral locations of the 7.8 event, the 7.3 event, and there are a couple of additional events shown here for reference. Uh, 1934 was the Great Nepal Bihar earthquake, uh, which resulted in a largest number of casualties um, from a series of events and had a magnitude, moment magnitude of 8.1. So the faults are capable of fairly large earthquakes and the hazard remains. 
In terms of the slip, the zone of slip that uh, resulted from this earthquake event, the slip area, it's, it's, the earthquake didn't result from a single point. It's a whole plane that ruptured. Uh, and it had an area of around 120 by 80 kilometers. And the estimated slip is, can, was up to six meters. So significant slip happened. And it ruptured in an east-southeast direction. And that's important to note in that we, this affected what we call directivity uh, and the damage pattern that we've observed in that we've observed far more damage within this zone compared to say a more westerly zone part of uh, Nepal. And that is a clear evidence of a directivity as a result of this event. Now as Earthquake engineers, we're always interested in the level of shaking that has occurred, not just the magnitude itself, but we would like to know the level of shaking. Unfortunately, up till today, we have access to only a single accelerometer uh, in Kathmandu and a number of GPS stations that were um, used in evaluating the, the slip. And the uh, recording in Kathmandu had some pretty unique features, actually. Um, it had a very low P ground acceleration, about PGA of 0.16 G. However, uh, if we use prior correlation, we expect a significantly higher level of shaking. So that is something that is uh, of significant interest uh, to us. And there are studies currently underway to understand what is the cause of this low, low level of P ground acceleration, is it a source effect, is it a source and a basin effect? Uh, so that's really uh, is a topic of going to be of significant study. Another important observation was very strong pulse uh, at long period, five seconds. That is, again, the source of that at five seconds is important for us to understand, is it also a source effect, the actual slip plane, or is it a basin effect or is it a combination of the two and this will hopefully be clarified with future studies and modeling. In addition, because even we had one uh, station, uh, we were able to record, that station recorded multiple events and one could see the amplification of the ground motion at different periods which is an expression of nonlinear site effects and period elongation. So that's again something that is going to be used in understanding and calibrating models of the basin of Kathmandu. Now it was fortunate that these, the PGA was low in the Kathmandu basin because that meant lower level of damage than would have been expected otherwise. So now, we, since we're talking about the Kathmandu Basin, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by that. It's an alluvial basin that has been de de uh, filled with deposits from rivers and streams. Uh, this is a cross-section, a geologic cross-section, uh, illustrating the Kathmandu Basin. It has thick deposits exceeding 500 meters. And when you're thinking about a basin, you want to think of uh, maybe a, sort of a little bit of a, an exaggeration of a bowl of jello. And if you shake it, it is going to shake a little bit differently than a firmer ground. And that will cause what we call basin amplification of the ground motion, which we saw that could be part of what is con has contributed to the five second uh, content of the ground motion. And also along the edges of this basin, there's also uh, additional amplification due to w uh, constructive wave interference. And that is also something that we looked for and in fact found evidence of that basin effect. So one of the things we did, we had uh, teams that collected information about building damage. And we found that there is a, a reasonable correlation between location of building damage and the basin edges within the Kathmandu Basin. So that provided us with evidence that uh, there appears to be some important basin edge effects. We also looked at uh, collected information on ground failures around the uh, Kathmandu Basin, and ground failures were in the form of cracking, in form of liquefaction, and in, for, in the form of lateral spreading. And again, 
we saw more concentration of these along the edges as opposed to within the, uh, the basin itself. And so that's also further evidence of a basin edge effect. We found a number of sites where liquefaction was observed and lateral spreading within the Kathmandu Basin. The deposits there are conducive to this kind of behavior. These are recent deposits. There's a relatively shallow water table between half meter to nine meter below ground surface. However, the earthquake occurred at the end of the dry season. So the water table was relatively low that combined with a relatively low levels of shaking and hence uh, while ground failure was observed in the form of liquefaction and lateral spreading but it wasn't pervasive. Uh, nevertheless there were some fairly dramatic uh, manifestation of that. The uh, one that was uh, really quite, quite observable was in Lokanthali. It was in the eastern side of the basin where we had liquefaction and cyclic soil failures. Uh, there were large lateral cracks, and this is a map that was produced by the team showing all the cracking and uh, the details of the movement that occurred. Uh, deep fissures were observed there as deep as two meters. Um, vertical offset in some areas of about 1.2 meters, quite dramatic. And uh, this is what was originally uh, observed by the first team and then when the second team came we did some d more detailed investigations including trenching whereby we looked at the offset in the soil layers. Also we had sampling of the soils there, looked at their characteristics and they were, were trying to figure out what was the cause of this type of uh, uh, failure that we've observed. There were two culprits that are potentially in play there clays, um, called black cotton clays, and also some sands. Looked at some of the material that had PIs of 7 to 9, and then water content to liquid limit ratio greater than 1. And so we have, uh, we, we think it's either the, there was some increased pore pressures in some of the layers that resulted in cyclic mobility, uh, or we had a structural breakdown of uh, sensitive clays and cyclic failure, and it could be also a combination of both. And uh, that is going to be subject of additional investigation, and this becomes important for Kathmandu as you're thinking, looking forward in terms of engineering design and how, and diagnosis of layers, whether they would liquefy or not. Now, I'm going to look at, move on to another element of ground response, which is topographic uh, effects. There was significant damage on top of ridges and hillsides. And uh, this is other than just simply landsliding, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and that is because we know, based on studies, theoretical studies, as well as field evidence, that there was significant amplification of the ground motion. Here you're looking at the top of a mountain. There was an old fort, actually. We landed there by helicopter, and there were cracks in the ground uh, on, on that hill all around it, and not just the top, even on the sides. And that was an evidence of significant amplification of the ground motion. We know that it exists, but this is something that we don't always explicitly account for in engineering design or building codes. So that's something we want to consider in areas where we have hills and mountains. So now let's move on to landslides and uh, uh, slope stability and landsliding. And uh, we, the, the whole country uh, is, is, has a, a steep slopes produced by this rapid tectonic uplift which we talked about. And it has a very high landslide hazard, even when there's no ground shaking. It, every monsoon, there's a significant amount of landsliding that occurs across the country. And uh, even though you see here, this is pretty steep terrain, but actually people live all across these terrains. And so the hazard is uh, quite significant to people as well as property. In, a, in Nepal, during the Gorkha earthquake, this was the dominant um, cause of damage. And it concentrated east of the epicenter, uh, which is a 
an additional evidence of directivity. It damaged and destroyed many villages. It caused thousands of casualties. It blocked roads and dammed rivers and caused damage to hydropower plants. In terms of the estimate, this is an example of a site that was dammed uh, or partially dammed by a landslide. Um, there were, the number of landslides are estimated to be in the tens of thousands. Uh, the failure surfaces in general were parallel to the slopes and uh, some cases were up to 100 meter, uh, 100, I'm sorry, 10 meters deep. Um, this is um, in one district only, there were estimated about, s the, there were 6,000 new or reactivated landslides. Um, Google Earth was used extensively to look at uh, existing landslides versus new landslides uh, as part of ongoing studies. I'm going to talk about a couple of landslide cases. Uh, one of them is the Langtang landslide. It is the largest and most destructive landslide from this earthquake. Uh, it initiated at an elevation of around 5,000 meters uh, with the glacial ice that as it started coming down the mountainside, it mixed with soil and rock. It buried Langtang village, over 200 casualties. And then the landslide itself also resulted in an air blast that flattened outlying structures and nearby forests up to one kilometer distance. Um, the estimated velocities uh, were around 22 to 99 meters per second. You can see here the debris that in fact it uh, blocked the river. However, uh, the river, there was no lake that formed uh, or permanent lake that formed because a tunnel uh, the water is flowing within a tunnel inside the snow uh, that melted and so uh, that may eventually, something may happen in the future there in terms of the uh, landslide and uh, the clearing of that debris. Not all landslides occurred immediately during the earthquake or after earthquakes. There were some ones, some landslides that actually occurred later on during aftershocks. But there were ones which just simply triggered, were triggered later on. The exact causes are unclear. One of them is one we ended up going to is the Kali Kandaki landslide. It's, um, think of it as a delayed triggering. It happened on May 24th. We woke up one day and they told us there's a landslide. It took us about 12 hours, I think, to get there. Um, there was some evidence of progressive raveling, and, uh, but uh, as soon as it formed, there was a one to three kilometer long lake that developed in 12 hours. By the time we arrived, that lake breached, and uh, the concern was that you'd have significant flooding downstream. Uh, fortunately, the authorities took enough precaution, precautions so that uh, no one was injured as a result of uh, this breach. In terms of dams and hydropower facilities, the, there is a significant potential in Nepal for generation of hydropower. Um, currently, there are 20 major projects uh, generating a lot of power, but actually much less than what is needed. Uh, there was damage to six Nepal Hydroelectric Authority projects and 10 private projects, and the gear team visited uh, projects along two rivers. Uh, this is a plan view showing us the GPS tracks of the team as they went up um, those two rivers and uh, the red designates projects that were damaged or affected one way or another by the landslides, uh, by, by, the, by the earthquake. Uh, m major causes of the damage were rock falls, landslides, debris flow, some settlements, tension cracks. And the types of damage were damage to structure, tunnels, canals, penstocks, equipment, and also access roads. A uh, couple of examples here of uh, these, uh, th such a damage. Uh, this is, we're looking at debris flow damage, um, damage to a worker's colony, to the powerhouse, to a penstock liner. Um, this is a damage of, to, to a project that is currently under construction, which is the uh, settlement of a, um, retention of the diversion dam that, um, that has been built on an alluvial deposit and it was settling not just during the earth, uh, during one event, but it had continued to settle throughout uh, the uh, various aftershocks and even some of the foreshocks. And that leads me to the conclusion, to conclude my talk today. Um, 
the earthquake that uh, Nepal experienced was a major destructive earthquake in a long series of earthquakes. Ground motions were uh, unique, raised some interesting questions. Landslide hazard is pervasive, and we need to th worry about it also afterwards uh, in terms of during monsoon rains or other shaking events. Hydropower projects were significantly affected. We really need more ground motion data, and that's something a challenge for all the community in the future. And there are many implications beyond Nepal. I encourage you to look at our report. Thank you.